All right. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Gnostic Studies. And we'd like to continue our series on the runes. And as usual, before we get into today's material, we're going to review the previous class. We're just wrapping up talking about these different um, philosophers or, or guys giving us ideas about the runes and how those seem to meet and join together to form the concepts about the runes that that carried over into Central and South America. One of the more influential and, and maybe better known, at least uh, theoretically, is this guy, um, Frederick Bernhard Marby. We talked about his theories last week. We're just going to touch a little bit more on it today in our review. He had uh, um, books, multiple volumes of books that he wrote in... Uh, in the first volume, he talked about this concept of sacred writing, sacred speech, and sacred action. And he said sacred writing or sacred script consists of line forms, script forms, and sign forms. Sacred speech, it consists of sound forms, which go with the image form. So the, the shape of a letter... Uh, has a sound. The letter has a sound. And then the action that goes with it. He says, but the sacred action consists of a shaping or forming of the body in which the image of the characters, the sound currents, and the vibrations of speech are brought into doing. That is, they are performed. And so he had all of these ideas, sacred action, sacred speech, I'm sorry, sacred writing, sacred speech, sacred action. And then they, they combine together into uh, the term Heil, which means hail, but it also means healing and salvation. So there's an integration of Health and religion. But not in an explicit religious context. So it's, 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 a, it's a bit of its own thing. Because they didn't exactly say what this salvation was. right? It's not explicit like in other religions where it's through X, Y, and Z that you're going to be quote-unquote saved. But the word means all of these different things. It means health, hail, as in when we're hailing someone, well-being, salvation. And even this other word, heilig, I don't know how to pronounce it, so pardon me if you know how to pronounce German. This word, which is building off of it, building off of Heil, means holy, sacred, saintly, devout, sanctified. And so all these things become connected together. You know, that which is holy, that which is uh, facilitates salvation or sanctification, health, well-being, and he's always talking about doing these practices because this is the first uh, like kind of book where he started giving exercises for each rune. Before that, we, we have maybe people that did it, but they didn't write it down, at least that we've been able to find. So the, he says, sacred writing arranges salvation conceptualizing. Or, or healing conceptual, healing concepts in us, healing thinking even. 
Sacred speech translates the concepts into power or force. So now we're, we're speaking, we're saying the mantras related with the specific rune that we're doing. And that, that translates the concepts that are contained in the rune into a force, into a power. And then that combined with taking the shape of it brings it in, into us. Sacred action shapes the force and sends it out through the corresponding body positions in the rune exercise. So Marby regarded the rune, the human being, sorry, Marby regarded the human being as a receiver and a transmitter. <coughs> as a receiver and a transmitter of cosmic waves and rays that animate the entire universe. This is a theme that we find in the sort of cosmology of uh, runologists. His theories for how to practice rune gymnastics were based on gathering runic energy from the what he called the Lodge of World Space or the Lodge of the Cosmos, which he divided into five aspects. Cosmic space, planetary and starry space, the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth itself, and then the inner Earth. Is a graphic from his book. So all these waves are coming to us, and then based on which runes we do, we can sort of extract the the energies from a different zone. In volume two of his book, published in 1932, he gives specific instructions for the Is or I rune, Ich rune, which we're going to look at in today's class. And um, that's sort of like the foundational exercise. For Marby, the exchange of forces within the various energy zones constitutes the phenomenon of the universe. He claims that the same way that uh, children learn nowadays to take the posture of letters and make the sound of the letters when they're very young is the ancient method that was used to work with the runes. Because it allows us to quickly internalize the shapes and the sounds. So... Marby saw the runes not just as letters or phonetic values, but as representations of postures and movements that could be performed in order to improve, improve one's reception, absorption, and projection of certain cosmic influences. So we're going to look at Telcher today before we look at Marby's exercise because he's the one that, that talks in more detail about this uh, philosophy or, or theory or these concepts of of the runes as like special shapes that talk about energy absorption projection etc so by imitating the shapes of the runes we're able to uh, gather energy particular type of energy and as as well as uh, you know so absorb it as well as project it, is his concept. And he gave nine basic factors related to the practice. Gorslebin came out with a book in, in 1930 which was uh, the year of his death, unfortunately, but it's going to happen to all of us, right? One way or another. And he talked about a primordial religion or an Ur religion. Remember, Ur means like uh, primordial, original, um, 
sometimes it's translated as primal. And that this religion was um, sort of the key from where all other religions originated. Very similar to the concept of the secret doctrine given by Blavatsky about 50 years earlier. He says, Our intent is to give an idea of the magnitude, greatness, and immediacy of the Ur vision, the original vision, the primordial vision that we have from birth, and that should be every religion. But where could we experience such a religion? Now is the time to retake the God experience of humanity. Our research then will not make true religion less important, but it will enrich it in presently unsuspecting ways. Only from the highest wisdom of the primordial religion can the renewing of all sects and churches emerge. Because this primordial religion alone has given them content and shape. As microcosmos, we are dependent on great infinite events in the macrocosmos, but we can add a lot to this through our own volition or willpower, so that we can grasp the meaning of our present life. A human life often passes far too fast without having found the connection to the energies of the cosmic will of its time. After we have shown the beginning runes and a few hieroglyphs, then we will we have to continue in order to give you a complete picture. So he says, the runes are symbols of the pulsating life. They are life itself reduced to a mathematical formula. And they're related to numbers. This is something that he uh, maybe emphasizes a little bit more than others. And he gives the same numbering that Guido von Liszt gave and that uh, became sort of popular pre-World War II. The origin of the runes is only to be understood based on knowledge of certain laws of a cosmic mathematical nature. The runes have been carved out from the heavens, from the universe, and due to this origin one can also prove their supernatural powers. The original form and the elements of the runic symbols are sections of a geometric shape which was the symbol of the cosmos since very ancient times. This is the hexagon that is inscribed in a circle, the tips of which are touching by the ends of the Hagal rune. Hagal or Hagal means all caring, that which caringly surrounds and embeds everything. The universe. So he gave these 18 chief runes, which again are, are pretty much the same as uh, Guido von Liszt's runes, although Guido von Liszt ends up adding some more. One look at this design the hexagon in, inside of a circle, shows even the uninitiated person that runes have been cut out of this image of the universe, or in better words, the universe has been cut up into the runes, which are its composing parts. Therefore, we should not be surprised if the initiates who knew and used the magical power of the runes also used them for oracles and decisions. This can be done in our days, provided that the person strives and seeks honestly, and then they can experience them in themselves. So he talks about the this force that exists 
in the runes, and he says that there's different types of force, and he's basically um, giving uh, his interpretation of Telcher, the guy we're going to read today, Telcher's perspective on it. So he says, we have to distinguish three types of force. The notion of force in general implying energy means that we force any kind of effort. There's three types of force. A, the movement of a dense matter or material or tangible body. This is the force in the mechanical sense. B, the movement of an invisible something of subtle matter. For instance, the creation of tension, such as electrical voltage. And C, the impulse to set into movement. For instance, the force of our willpower. A is the final effect, B is the medium, and C is the cause or trigger. Nothing happens without a cause or a trigger. Matter is the element of form. The elementary particles of which the subtle matter is composed is at least a thousand times smaller than the atoms of dense matter. So he's got this little graphic here. So subtle energies modify subtle substances and those subtle substances modify dense matter. So creation or manifestation happens downwards and then of course there can be some reaction from dense matter that affects the subtle energies that then affects the, I'm sorry, the subtle substances that affects the subtle energy. So it can go back and forth. And he uses music as an example, the sound that comes from music. He says, let's look at the acoustic processes in nature. Nature served as the primary model for every primitive technology. The most brutal sound is the thundering from lightning. What is its purpose? It intends to cleanse. The extent to which the purifying impulse that is concealed in the sound of thunder is generating ozone should be left to a sound chemistry of the future. Therefore, brutal, suddenly stopping sounds contain cleansing impulses. What is the purpose of a murmur of a peacefully flowing brook? It intends to enliven. All sounds that are trickling and murmuring contain enlivening sounds. En I'm sorry, enlivening impulses. In the future, music will, serve, will not serve recreation alone. But, as happened already in ancient times, it will also serve for work. The rhythmic songs that in ancient times accompanied all work have disappeared from daily practice, with the exception of some minute leftovers of this method. The song brought the breath into a rhythm and made it capable of specific peak achievements, especially when people work together. Let's remember the heave-ho, for instance, when people jointly lifted something heavy. In ancient times, people knew that rhythmic breathing could be used to eliminate gravity. From the word to the rune that corresponds to it is only a small mental step. The starting point for these explanations of the runes as streams of subtle energies of the universe was found in the magical technical experiments and in the research on subtle energies by the physicist, painter, and philosopher Dr. Frederick Telcher. So we're going to look at his stuff now. So, Dr. Telcher was a doctor of engineering who taught at the University of Innsbruck in Austria and who also discovered the intellectual biorhythm of 33 days. This is um, an idea that there's a, a sort of a cycle related with the intellect of 33 days. I think there's other ones. Uh, I think there's an emotional one that's 28 days, and I forget what the other one is. 
and it might be 22 days. Uh, but the idea is there's sort of like a peak time when you can make great advances and, and, you know, you can progress quickly. And then there's a time when sort of the energy is low and you're not progressing as fast or not able to understand as fast, etc. So it's just sort of like observing and seeing cycles. Uh, in the 1920s, he seemed to have begun publishing a magazine called Hag All All Hag, later cha changed simply to Hagal, where he said the following. We're living on the earth, and we see the stars moving along their tracks in the night sky. The first basis of the knowledge of our world image, therefore, is an optical one. Modern astronomy is based on the law of gravity. This means that two bodies attract each other with a force that is inversely proportional to the square of their distance from each other. That's, that's Newton's law of universal gravitation. In order to deepen our understanding for an exact worldview, we have to gain knowledge of the energies that are blocked, for instance, that Earth would be pulled into the sun if it did not have its own movement. Now astrology assumes an influence of the position of the stars upon the destiny of people. And astrometeorology is based on the influence of stellar positions upon the formation of the weather, that, that, the, uh, that there's astrological influence on the weather. Similarly, we could develop an astrogeology. Yet all these influences do not fit into the worldview of exact science because neither the science of the light nor the science of gravity can explain such influences. Therefore, we are either forced to reject the astrosciences or to search for an expansion of the basic energies that are considered to be active in our model of the world. So what he's trying to propose here is that we don't have a way of understanding how astrology influences us. So he's going to make an attempt to give us a, uh, an explanation. He says, let's make such an attempt to go this route. And let's state a preliminary working hypothesis of a third basic energy besides light and mass or gravity. Right? Because he said that there is the light, studying, studying the light, uh, what's it called, spectronomy, something like that where they'll look at a star and then they'll analyze the, the light coming off of it and they'll be able to detect certain type of elements. Uh, and then they'll, then the other way is to look at the, um, the gravity based on the movements of things around, so the, the density of it or the mass and how that affects the gravity and pulls the planets or, or celestial bodies around it. So he says, other than those two, we want to work on this third one, which he says are streams of subtle energy. We can assume these subtle energy streams to be free energies that are active without being blocked in any way, that the planets and the sun and stars send towards the earth, and that have the role of basic energies that provide formation. They provide the formation of something. All more subtle compositions of minerals, stones, petrifications, but also of living beings, are, according to this hypothesis, the consequences of streams of subtle energies, which come to our Earth from the universe. These flows or currents of subtle energy would even be part of the shaping of our mood and would have influence upon the economic and political events of the Earth. The assumption of streams of subtle energy would then clarify an array of facts that to this day could not be explained. In the following, it is important that we bring proof of the possibility of the existence of energies of a subtle nature that act in such a way, because a working hypothesis can only become a science if it is backed by sufficient facts as proof. Be these historical facts done by experiment and furthermore if the practical usefulness has been established I should say and if the practical usefulness has been established okay here we will briefly touch upon an important question 
If streams of subtle energy exist, why have they not been discovered long ago and analyzed with precision? With this question, we touch upon the most difficult obstacle to overcome in this whole situation. The answer is that because these energies are so subtle, they escape our direct observation most of the time. In other words, our normal organs of perception, such as the eye and the ear, are not suited to detect streams of subtle energies, and our internal sensory organs are degenerated most of the time. Notwithstanding, the streams of subtle energies can be proven under some circumstances. Consider the revelation from modern quantum mechanics that a beam of electrons is affected by the act of being observed. A possibility to explain the runes could perhaps be in the characteristic as symbols of for compounds of streams of subtle energies, not unlike chemical compounds. So he's saying that these shapes that we see on the screen right now are symbols for compounds of streams of subtle energy. Certain types of energy. In ancient traditions, we can see that the cosmic feeling of the ancients was already on a high level, certainly on a much higher level than is the case with most people of present times. We can then assume that this could also have manifested in the symbols of writing, such as in the runic alphabet. Let's try to examine the runic symbols on the basis of this assumption. For that purpose, we have to put the runes into groups or classes. Namely, there's, he's got basically three of them. Runes with full length lines. Lines which are of equal length. Uh, like Hagal, Not, Is, Eh, Kibor. Uh, category B or class B runes with full length and half length lines that's most of the other ones right and then C runes which consist only of half lines which are like uh, here sig rune That's the only one I can see right now. Group A can be regarded as connection of equivalent streams of subtle energies because each full connection of equivalent streams of subtle energies because each full length line describes an individual stream of subtle energy. The angle of the intersection of 60 degrees means a harmonic interaction and cooperation of the corresponding streams of subtle energies. According to that, we have three such connections. With number one, the East rune, only one full line, therefore the only stream of subtle energy. Number two, the E rune, or Ehe rune, a harmonic connection of two streams of subtle energies. And number three, the Hagal rune, harmonic connection of three streams of subtle energies. Connections with more than three independent streams of subtle energies would not exist in our world according to this grouping. So three is the maximum. In group B, which is full and half length, lines would mean auxiliary lines of power. Shorter lines would mean auxiliary lines of power or energy which adapt themselves to the basic streams of subtle energy, such as is the case with the Lof rune, as well as most of the Futhark runes. The vertical full line supports the main flow of subtle energy while the inclined line or lines are working with the auxiliary flow of subtle energy. As Werner ba von Bülow has shown, the runic inscriptions and old coats of arms, which are also runic documents according to their lines and images, refer to flows of subtle energy that trigger movements in the sidereal pendulum, and that the experimenter holds above that the experimental holds above them. So this is the idea that if you get a, a pendulum, um, like a dowsing pendulum, 
where it's like a it's not like a big thing it's like a little thing you can hold it's got a little chain or, or a rope and then it's got like a metal or heavier thing hanging at the bottom that when you put that over a drawing or a printout of the runes that it will move more than if you put it over uh, nothing or, or something else and implying that there's some inherent energy in the rune. So it's interesting to do that experiment. In other words, runes and coats of arms in nature or also on photographs are not giving the usual vibrations and figures of the pendulum that the substance upon which they are engraved, that is stone, wood, or metal, is supposed to deliver. But they produce specific images that still have to be interpreted. They it's it, the pendulum moves not based on the material the type of material that that it is but because of the shape the runic shape there still remains hard work to be done in this regard these hints should suffice for the moment the extremely important and basic meanings of the runes symbols as images of connection between and combinations of subtle energies is obvious by now Accordingly, the ancient runes are symbols that somewhat correspond to the symbols of modern chemistry. To interpret and recognize the ancient runes as symbols, like those of modern chemistry, would have a significant expansion of our world view. This conclusion may seem a bit too early, even too bold. A final judgment is possible only after science has penetrated into the field of the physics of subtle energies, which is entirely new for us. But we're fortunate enough to have a historical mo monument that gives us a few hints from which the deeper meaning of the runes, as far as natural processes are concerned, emerges very clearly. With this, we mean the very ancient song in the Edda, Wotan's rune song, and some passages in the Skalds, the narrative of the uh, Edda, the, I'm sorry, the Kaparmal. From this song, we can clearly see that each rune contains a healing power as well as a defensive power. Here, the rune is not just a pure means for communication, such as our modern symbols of writing, but each rune mentioned here as a means to cause or force a specific state within ourselves or around us. Let me read it to you again. Each rune mentioned here has a means to cause or force a specific state within ourselves or around us, and this is exactly what we mean when referring to the notion of connections with streams of subtle energies. Let's take the East rune as the most simple example. Wotan says re regarding it, and of course this is um, Guido von Liszt's interpretation of which rune it is, because he says that he's the one that gave these correspondences to the uh, Havamal, to the rune song, Wotan's rune song. This I sing as a ninth, when distress at sea forces me to protect my ship against the billowing floods. The storm I cause to calm down, and I calm down the sea as well, and I put waves into slumber. In the opinion that we present here, this would refer to the basic law concerning the streams of subtle energies on our planet. On one hand, we can reconstitute disturbed balances in the air with the help of a simple stream of subtle energy. On the other hand, we have to look at the streams of subtle energy when trying to explain disturbances in the air and the weather. Proof that modern science has not yet explained everything in the field of hydromechanics are the appearance of basic waves in otherwise calm weather, for instance in so-called shooting or roaring on the Lake uh, Constance in Europe, on the Rhine in the northern foot of the Alps. This appears most pro pronouncedly when the hot wind starts, i.e. disturbances of the air. This can be easily explained as an accompanying effect when seen in the light of simple streams or flows, currents of subtle energy. In any case, several very unique natural phenomena point to the fact 
that we by far do not know our Earth sufficiently, and no doubt we will achieve significant progress in this field with the introduction of the notion of subtle flows of subtle, I'm sorry, with flow, the notion of flows of subtle energies. Now let's go back to Wotan's rune song. From the interpretation of this single stanza, follows very clearly that with technology of streams of subtle energy, we can achieve a much more perfect control of natural processes than with the means of modern technology. You know, he's basically trying to explain um, occultism here, right? Or uh, higher science. Perhaps our ancestors possessed extensive means in this field. People of our days have, start, have to start all over again, and here we find it a concise path, starting with a little experiment in the laboratory, slowly ascending and progressing all the way to a cosmic power plant. Something similar has happened with the development of the technology of electricity that started with frog legs and went all the way to the electric train. Finally, we want to mention a very important fact. At the end of the song, there is an emphasis on the development of technology of streams of subtle energies will play an important role. Then it is also necessary that we acquire basic knowledge in this field. We are not saying to acquire treasures of knowledge alone, but on the contrary, to acquire the interior experience or co-experience of them. Therefore, the technology of subtle energies will not find any fertile ground with people who measure the value of a science with a yardstick and with scales, but those who feel streams of subtle energies within themselves. The streams of subtle energies are the murmuring runes. They murmur, flow, and surge within ourselves and in their language continuously tell us what is good for us, what we have, what we are lacking, etc. And they bestow upon us strong power and health. But they also bring the close end of dense matter. It is unfortunate that there is not just life-giving and good subtle matter. Let me read that again. It is unfortunate that there is not just life-giving and good subtle matter, but we know that there are also noxious or poisonous subtle matter and streams of subtle energies corresponding to dense matter. Right? So just in the same way that there are substances that can make us healthier, there are substances that can make us unhealthy and ill. He's saying it's the same case with subtle matter and subtle energies. Accordingly, we can at least partially ascribe the bad vibrations of some locations, paintings, rooms, precious stones, etc., to poisonous subtle matter. We had better listen to them because there are, they are our inner help warning us against accidents and disease. They are the guardians of our health. We should never neglect the strengthening we should never neglect strengthening the streams of subtle energies in our body by means of exercise, sports, massage, deep breathing, runic postures, etc. by means of joy goodness and love. As important for life as streams of subtle energy are, if they are flowing where they should flow, they can become noxious when they get to places where they should not go. As a whole, they are the ur element of our inner feelings, and the feeling is everything, says Goethe. The new doctrine of the subtle energy introduces an important era, i.e. the connection of materialism with spiritualism. It delivers the bridge upon which a new cosmic culture can take the first step into a new era. All pure humans who are striving to get ahead are now starting from materialism or spiritualism and they have to unify. As long as there is a dissipation, as has been going on, nothing great can happen in terms of a valuable leadership towards mutual recognition on both sides. Therefore, it will be a difficult task 
because the materialists and the spiritualists both believe they already know everything and that they are exclusively correct. We do not deny the dense material world, but we cannot deny the world of subtle matter and its facts either. Only this way can we find the best of both worlds. If we are familiar with dealing with the streams of subtle energy, then we can learn to direct these energies and to use them for the well-being of all humans. The main effect of the runes lies in the fact that, they're, that they are spiritual means to cleanse and nourish, i.e. that they have an effect on spiritual cleansing and nourishment. The main effect, let me read to you again, the main effect of the runes lies in the fact that they are spiritual means to cleanse and to nourish, i.e. that they have an effect of spiritual cleansing and nourishment. The new realm of knowledge and proof that the doctrine of subtle energies opens up for us will be revolutionary for humanity in its multiple potentials for use, similar to the discovery of electricity. But the subtle materials are not only limited to that which is material, but they relate above all to that which is spiritual and emotional, to what is related to the soul. If we do not limit ourselves to the five senses with which to perceive the environment, then we reach a territory of that which is above the senses, i.e. things that up to this point in time remain closed to conscious experience and experimental tests. Of course, there have been exceptions to that in all eras, and these exceptions have been documented by the most ancient of traditions of humanity, provided we understand correctly myths and legends and the sacred books of all peoples in all times. And we know that there was once a magical era with humans who could do more than humans of our days, no matter how evolved our technique of dense matter may be. The last example is... Uh, he gives cosmic meaning for the runes. For these runes. So this will be in the in the handout. So now we're going to jump into the rune practices. This is the, the basic practice. Let's just see if we have any uh, questions or comments. Just a woo-woo. Appreciate that. We've got another one here. These videos are so good. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Glad that it's uh, useful for you. We found this information very useful ourselves. So um, that's why we want to share it. All right. Today's... Practice, finally, we're getting into practices. We're on, what, the 10th class, right? Took a little bit of time. And we'll start, we got one more class, maybe one or two more classes, I think. Hopefully just one more, if we can cover it all next class. And then we're going to be studying the runes, and there'll be a practice in every class. Okay, but this is the basic or preliminary rune practice that we we want to start from this, which is the is or ich or uh, I rune, just standing in um, European military position, which is heels together and the feet splayed out, si leaving a 60 degree angle. Arms at the sides, chin is tucked, not forcing the head back too far, but just enough so that the spine is aligned. And so that uh, the, the head is kind of sitting on top of the spine and on top of the torso. You may have to play with it for a little bit if you're used to sitting. Uh, it's very similar to like a qigong, or tai chi, or um, uh, different postures that are done for martial arts, eastern martial arts, where, where in terms of the neck head position. The, the leg position is different. That's the basic thing. 
So it can be performed anywhere and at any time. And it should be done, he says, as often as is possible when one is trying to familiarize themselves with these type of exercises. It works as a type of training as well as strengthening of the body and of the attention, resulting in an all-around rejuvenation. It does help the awareness. It could be performed in a standing position, which is the preferred position, as well as walking or sitting. If you're standing, if you're standing then you take the basic military position, body erect, eyes focused straight ahead, chin down. It really is, is not chin down, right? Because you're not bringing the chin to the chest. So for us, we would say in English, touch, tuck the chin, chest out with your feet touching at the heels. If you're walking, then you want to keep your feet straight, your elbows slightly bent and your palms facing upward in a slightly cupped position. So the thumbs are touching the sides of the palms. In the sitting form, you sit straight, your back wants to be straight in a chair, knees are together, with your palms on your knees, and the arms are at the sides of the body, touching the sides of the body. Because you're trying to imitate this shape, the Isrun. It's kind of like an I, a capital I in uh, Roman characters. He says the only thought that you should have is I am here. Practice often and in any location. So then he gives certain breathing exercises that you do while you're in this position. Inhale for five seconds, exhale for five seconds, maintain a rhythm of breath for a little bit, and then you softly, you combine with a vocalization. So first you're just going to stand there and inhale at kind of a, a regular pace. Once you get comfortable, then you can do the I vowel, which is pronounced like E. He says do it in a tone which is most comfortable and natural for yourself. Once this is comfortable, the natural tone has been mastered, Practice raising the pitch of the note as high as you can. So that would be like this. E it's interesting, you can feel the energy go up towards your head when you do that. Next, try expanding the length of the initial I sound to 10 seconds. So, right, just extending out the vowel, vocalizing it longer. Then, as you raise the tone from the lowest point to the highest level, visualize or sense the energy rising from below your feet out through the top of your head. So let me try it. E. It's not too difficult to visualize that. You can kind of feel it moving. Each time you repeat the exercise, feel the energy of the tone rise from below upwards through the length of your whole body. Then on the next inhalation, begin from high, the higher sound, and spiral the sound down to the lowest level. So, Spiral up and down your body with each breath. The overall effect of the sound will be something like a siren. The time period of the actual transition from the highest to the lowest is relatively short, usually about four seconds, with the end tone being held for however long is comfortable for you at that stage. 
Next, step six. Step is very similar to the previous one, except you repeatedly jump from the highest to the low tone. So this this one sounds to me more like a siren. E something like that. Again, at the same time as above, except you jump from the highest to lowest tone. You are making. So hold on. The step is very similar to step six. The step is very similar to the previous one, except you're repeatedly jumping from the lowest to the highest tone. Okay, well, I did both, right? And then you jump from the, lo uh, from the highest to the lowest, and then you start to do it faster. So those are basically his ideas with it. So you stand in the position, you take up the position of the rune, you imitate the shape of the rune, then you make the sound associated with it, and then you start to change the uh, the tone of the sound. To follow Marby's instructions correctly, one would always go through the steps in the specified order, mastering the first step before going on to the second. Each subsequent step is added only after the previous one had been practiced for at least seven days. According to the schedule, it should take at least 54 days to complete the program. When the program is complete, one will have a solid foundation for the art and practice of runic gymnastics and rune song. One can also add basic affirmations to the routine. Right? We mentioned already that the basic exercise is just to stand in that position and to say to yourself, I am here, right? And this can be used since we're already a, uh, aware of this concept that we're an antenna. We begin with remembering also that we're an antenna absorbing energies from the cosmos through our head and, and bringing them in, passing through the body and sending them out through our feet. Now, Marby says we could also be absorbing them through our feet and sending them out through our head. Right? It goes back and forth. It goes uh, uh, top down or bottom up. So he says you can add basic affirmations. One of them, that your whole body is an antenna or a magnetic conductor of currents from all five zones of the Lodge of World Space. All of these currents flow to and through you. And all are running parallel to your own currents. You guide them. See yourself in the midst of the whole cosmos with the great distances of outer space and inner space above and below you. According to Marby, the actual results of this program of exercises should be overall feeling of vitality and strength, feeling of lightness of being and of being rejuvenated of the, or rejuvenation of the soul, feeling of being effective in action in all that you do, with clearer thoughts and quieter emotions. We could say quieter negative emotions. Additionally, you should be able to increase your ability to attract people to yourself and to be able to settle strife between people in your immediate environment. You'll become calm and vital and will emit this quality into your surroundings. Got a nice, nice graphic from his book here. All right, that was Marby. Technically, he printed his book first. Doesn't mean that somebody else didn't already have these exercises or these practices and people were already practicing them before. Uh, but in terms of a book and in a printed publication that we've, we've been able to tie down, Marby in, in 1930 and then Coomer in 1932. So he also talks about a very similar exercise. He says, Within us lies the great experience of God and of nature. High cosmic connectedness. Through rune exercises and rune dancing, the student will get to the point 
where this great experience breaks through again and awakens in their spirit. This will allow us to experience the all-connectedness to gain the deepest knowledge of God. In the past, rune exercises and dances belonged to the high mysteries, which were considered necessary in order to bring the initiate to the greatest development and to elevate them to the state of the God-man or God-woman. Rune positions and dances were the main form of education for priests and priestesses and led to the development of the highest seers and prophets. Dear brother or sister, the need of the hour calls you to this work. Always strive to educate yourself in the love for the All-Father, in nobility, beauty, and goodness. You can do this because the core of these things lies in your spirit. As such, you will be able to satisfy the requirements of the future culture and be victorious over beastly humanity. Let us now begin with the exercises. Very interesting, his perspective, right? We need to dominate or, or uh, become victorious over beastly humanity. We could say we still need to do that, right? We still need to dominate that in ourselves. So Kumar has his own uh, little affirmation here. With the body firm, face the north. Thy spirit gives thee the commanding words. The icy calm or peace, according to the way of the Ur Father. Many a secret is kept within thee. The student must, first of all, learn to fully master or control their body. Therefore, they do the following exercise every morning after bathing. One stands in the middle of a room in a firm posture, right? We already know this posture. Heels together, basic military position, which is the ich, is, or I rune position, and they face the north. Now one's body is ready for commands. So one says loudly and energetically, I am your supervisor. You have to obey me fully and completely. All muscle twitches are eliminated starting today. You have to submit to me. Now I want you to stand at attention before your supervisor, yourself or inner being. The student tries to spiritually picture themselves as a member of divine humanity. They immerse themselves in this picture, so much so that they completely forget the body. One must wish to see the spiritual picture ever more clearly, more vividly, and more tangibly. This exercise should take between 10 to 20 minutes. Above all, the student must gain calm or peace, patience and perseverance, which is absolutely necessary in order to penetrate into the rune mysteries. Calm, patience, and perseverance are necessary in order to penetrate into the rune mysteries. In the East Rune posture, the practitioner is tuned in to certain universal waves, like an antenna of nature, through which one incorporates waves of subtle force into oneself according to the practitioner's fundamental vibration, either good, healing, and invigorating, or corrupt, weakening, and even demonic. So we, obviously it means we need to pay attention to our fundamental vibration. When using the E sound in this position, it resonates through the whole body, sounding from the head, from the top of the skull, down the spine, through the legs, and down to the middle of the feet. If the E tone is raised in the same way as when posing a question, E, then the wave flows upward through the body in reverse, beginning under the heels. If the practitioner sings the E in different pitches, E has a different sensation in the body. It also is perceived as a, I'm sorry, it also is perceived as a different sensation in the body. I have been aware of this for years. Frederick Marby already made this observation before John Gorslebin. So it, this term, ich, I-C-H in German, means a lot of different things, right? Like many words. It means self or one's person. It could also mean ego, the I part of the psyche. 
But in this context, it seems to be referring to the true self, which we call the being or the inner being in Gnosis. And sometimes we've used the term spirit to refer to the being, the intimate or intimus. Kumar also has a breathing exercise. Again, all of these things are available to you in the uh, download so that you can have a, your own copy of this information. But this is the last little section we're going to cover for today. He says, full and deep breathing through the nose is a principal condition for all rune exercises. And every student has to make it to the point that they can do they cannot do anything else but full and deep breathing. So this must become a daily requirement. The initiate of occultism will already be familiar with breath or breathing theory. The beginner should remember that proper breathing is essential for lasting health, not only for prolonging one's life, but also for significantly increasing resilience and life force. The first breathing exercise. The student positions themselves in front of an open window, Taking up the already mentioned ich rune position, pushes out the chest slightly and raises the head. Now one breathes in deeply through the nose with the mouth closed, internally counting to seven. Next, push the air down into the lower lungs, keeping it down, counting to five. Then one breathes out through the nose, counting to seven again. The student does this exercise three times. Then one breathes in rhythmically through the nose for seven seconds, filling all the parts of the lungs, and then breathes out for seven seconds. Then one repeats the first exercise three more times. When inhaling, the student should imagine that they're taking in a great deal of invigorating energy, and while exhaling, they should realize they are expelling all that spent and corrupt substances from the body. So here's a summary of the exercise. Take the ich rune position. Inhale through the nose, count to seven, Hold the breath for five, and exhale, count to seven. Then do that two more times. Then inhale through the nose for a count of seven, and then immediately exhale for a count of seven. And then do the inhale, hold for five, exhale three more times. Through these breathing exercises, which are be to be performed daily in the morning and in the evening, a strong feeling of calm and harmony is achieved. If the student is agitated or was in a verbal exchange with someone, then they should do one of the above exercises, which will immediately restore their calm and then radiate it to the other person. So then we should radiate that calm to the other person. Also, the student should not forget that the Ichrun position, that in the Ichrun position they consciously stand as a living antenna in a sea of currents, waves, that give them spiritual force. Therefore, besides the exercises, one also accustoms oneself to a straight posture as opposed to a bent and sunken posture. Likewise, nervousness and unnecessary hand movements also hinder the flow of the universal force. Third exercise. Every day the student sits down at an open window or in a cold season at a closed window in a well-ventilated room. One completely relaxes the body, does the breathing exercises already mentioned, and directs their eyes into the distance with a steady gaze, if possible to the north or east, and in no way allows oneself to be distracted by things or objects that are within one's sight. One should switch off all thoughts and remain in perfect calm for a quarter of an hour. Fourth exercise, in the evening. Before going to bed, the student practices the previously mentioned breathing exercise, and then, while remaining in the ich rune position, one says to oneself the following. Myself is awake. Alternatively, we could say, I am awakening, or my inner being is awakening me. I am a child of humanity. I serve it through higher development, and thereby acquire magical abilities. I consciously walk the path towards you, All-Father. Therefore, I always have your protection and your blessing. I love my brothers and sisters and am kind to all people. I will defeat all weaknesses in me, thus creating a better, healthier life for myself. 
I want to become wise and noble. With all my force, I openly fight all the corruption, vulgarity, inferiority, and evil which hinders my spiritual development. I live in harmony and send out only noble good thoughts. Thus through thee, all Father, I will arrive at the luminous goal. Now the student goes to bed and sends out good thoughts and wishes. They will wake up healthy, happy, and well-tuned, like a well-tuned instrument. After washing or bathing, they will do their morning exercises and then go about their business. The above exercises are to be done for seven days, but they can be extended to 14 days. So those are the two different versions of the basic rune exercise. The fundamental aspect is the same, standing, basic military position, or European military position, which is heels together, and um, chin tucked, chest out just a little bit, spine straight, arms at the sides. And the feet splayed out about 60 degrees. So now we're going to open it up for uh, for questions or comments. If you have any, please let us know. Um, next week, we're hoping we're going to be able to do a class next Sunday. And we'll continue with this uh, series. So we invite you to join us for that. Uh, and we do encourage you to practice this exercise at the very least it can help you remember that uh, that what we call in gnosis self-remembering that we're here on this planet and we have an opportunity to do something we're like a little antenna receiving energies coming in from the outside descending you know the energy is descending from the cosmos and the energy is coming up from the earth and they're mixing inside of us, just like Krumheller mentioned in the um, Zodiacal Course, right? So we can become more conscious of that. And with that, we can remember the opportunity that we have and stop the momentum of the ego, trying to get us to be identified with negative emotions or uh, anger or, you know, whatever it may be. And then we can just be like, wow, you know, I'm I'm alive in this moment in in the physical body. I I have possession of a physical body for for a little bit longer. And and that's the nice thing about these exercises; is that they help that that uh, enlivening that that awareness. They help cultivate that, which gives us a different perception of our experience, which then changes the way that we interpret and deal with and interface with our experiences while we're aware <laughs> while we have our physical body right for the moment or for the moments that we have it so in any case um doesn't look like there's any questions or comments at this time we do have a a, a thank you and so we want to say you know, appreciate you paying attention, sharing your attention with us. Hopefully this has been useful. We are glad that we're finally getting to some practices. I know it's been a, a little bit, but uh, we wanted to go through the previous material so you could see where these concepts are coming from, how things are sort of coming together. And, uh, and now, you know, we encourage you to do this practice, even if it's for two seconds when you're going to the bathroom at work or at school or during the day when you're walking to to go to 
wherever you need to go. Just, you know, remember that you're an antenna receiving energies from the cosmos. Because with these exercises, we're going to try and cultivate that energy, which as, as uh, the authors we studied today mentioned, they can help us to be more calm. They can help us to, to be more vital. And, and we can give you testimony that that has happened, that it does happen when we're consistent with the practices. And uh, it even helps us, as was mentioned, to settle strife between our fellow human beings. So it's, it's pretty amazing what these exercises do. And you don't really need to believe anything. You just practice them. And for that, you study and you take the position, you vocalize, and then you quiet the mind, but the, oftentimes the mind will be quiet from doing the practice. And then maybe you sit to meditate afterwards and you receive some information or you help that re- helps you receive something that helps you understand better or comprehend an ego or whatever it may be or comprehend a situation. So we, we hope that your attention here will translate into uh, doing some practices and the momentum that you can gain from doing those practices will continue. And with that, we want to say thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and attention with us. And we want to wish you the best in your esoteric work. So until next time.